Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me for the second time this year. And once again, I got to blame Cliff for dragging me into doing this. Um, that's what you get when having somebody over to your shack. Uh, he sees stuff and he goes, hey, the club needs this. So got roped in and so did some serious writing for you. And hopefully you enjoy the next hour because this is going to be an hour's worth of content. Um, it's a lot of information we're going to throw at you, but hopefully in a way you'll be able to grasp it easily. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a little background on the subject matter. Uh, we'll go into the types of surges that are out there. And you know, your ham shack and your home electrical system are connected to one another. You got to realize that. And since they're interconnected electrically, what's your risk and exposure? We'll go through some of that. And you just don't want to surge protect your shack. And um, there was an interesting article in QST for those of you who have just gotten it. It's a good article. Don't get me wrong. This is a perfect shack. It's a great article on surge protection and what he did. But I would bet 99% of us can't do that. And then number two is he sort of forgot the rest of the house. So, you know, when the lightning hits or the surge comes and your hand shack works, but your refrigerator and freezer and air conditioner and all that aren't working, then you have a little different problem. So I want to address that part of the, the home. And what are your options? So as a ham operator, you have some options. As a homeowner, you have other options. And I want to go into a little bit of the electrical system and the electronics that go on inside your house. And then we'll take some questions at the end. So lots of disclaimers here. Number one, I am not a licensed electrician. So I'm going to go on the record for that. I am, however, a hell of a DIYer with electricity. I could wire your house, but I'm not a licensed electrician. I had a lot of training in school. I took the shop classes. I loved electrical and electronic shop classes. Wish they did more of that. And I also had training from my employer, which was Square D. Um, this presentation is not endorsed by Schneider Electric, so I want to say that right away. Um, but attribution is provided throughout because I worked for him for 28 years, so I do have a little bit of knowledge about some of the source materials. And Search protection was an area of focus for me as a marketer. I work very closely with the electricians and the design engineers on our surge protection because I had to be able to explain it to the public. And I'm always an engineer wannabe too. I guess that's my other problem. So some of the visuals I provide will be from our residential products offering at Square D. However, competitive manufacturers, which you may have in your house, it could be Siemens, it could be Cutler Hammer, uh, Eaton, uh, all have surge protection, but I have to use the reference materials I had access to. I've been a ham for 45 years. I covered that back in March when I was here. And I've experienced two indirect lightning strikes, personally. And I know people who've had hits, because I pay attention to that stuff. So I've learned a lot from the damage that can occur from these. And I'll go into that a little bit. So there's really three types of surges. Everybody thinks, well, a surge is a surge is a surge is a surge. No, it's not. First of all, you have lightning-induced surges, or what they call the direct hit, and then, as I like to say, church is over, you, you know, call the insurance company. You have in utility-induced surges that are happening all the time. And then you have what I call homeowner-induced surges that you cause in your house that can also damage your equipment. So we're going to cover all three of them to start. So let's talk about lightning. It's the most destructive type. It's the one we most often think about when we have a surge incident happen. It's like, oh man, I'm gonna get hit by lightning. Well, yeah, it's pretty powerful stuff. You know, 5KA to 200KA strike power. So it does cause damage. You see it on TV, people's houses on fire, and you know, the damage is extensive. Um, and the currents aren't the same for each bolt. Sometimes you can have a small strike and sometimes you can have a real large one. It just depends what nature's gonna throw at you. And that strike could have 18 strokes in one second. So the importance of surge protection and what it's gotta do in your house has to be in the nanosecond range. It has to respond that fast. So important to know that, oh, well, I needed something that would fire in a second. Not too late, it's already cooked everything. So, when you look at the cloud potential for a negative lightning strike, and I know Laura probably, if she's on, is into this stuff, it's 50 to 100 million volts. So it's going to ionize things. Um, some of the most powerful lightning bolts have been, can exceed a billion volts. You think about that and you go, wow, what's that doing to you? 
So it can strike, you know, it can strike a lot of energy into an area and it makes them as very dangerous, especially the positive types. So those of you who get into weather spotting, there's negative and then positive types of strokes. The positive ones are the, the most dangerous. So you have direct and indirect. So direct hit, you know what those are all about. It destroys structures, it causes fires, it'll give you equipment damage, and it can spread out via the ground. So when it hits the ground, you are now, the ground becomes, even though a ground, we think of ground as a ham operator is the place you want to throw excess current. When nature strikes it, there's so much energy, the ground does carry some of that current for a distance. So it can spread out and come back in through your house ground system. So keep that in mind as we talk about this and go on. Indirect, that's what we call an impulse. So you're going to have energy coming into your structure without it touching your structure, okay? So that's what we call cloud to cloud, or it could be a nearby ground strike and there's just enough impulse energy flying through the air a couple of doors down that you're getting there. And the high currents induce surges. So think about this, your home's electrical system is just like your radio antenna when it comes to lightning strikes. It can induce currents into your house wiring and distribute throughout. Very important fact. So when you see it up overhead, there's current flying around, but if it's close enough, it will induce into your house and we'll cover all that. It can get into your cable TV, your electrical system, or your, um, your ethernet network. So we'll go through some examples. I've been hit, like I said. When I lived in Mundelein, Illinois years ago, my first strike I had there was, you know, caused minor damage. The east side of my house was bedrooms and the living room, so there wasn't a lot there. The strike was in that direction, and there was one bathroom there that, that cooked the GFCI. So, okay, no big deal, I got lucky. The second strike, a few years later, after I thought I had done a lot of protection, found a weak point in my search system. So this is the other idea I want to cover today is that it can get in any way. Wherever the weakest point is in your protection network, Mother Nature will find it. And it found it for me. I had five towers. One of them was a TV antenna tower 300 feet away to reduce RFI. You know, I didn't want it in the TV system at home. It induced it in that system. It came into my house through that rotor cable. It went into a, the rotor box, and then I had a distribution box above for all the wiring that went on in that, in that cabinet. It smoked my TV, uh, DVD player, TV, and satellite receiver in that cabinet, and then it went down into the electrical system from there. It says, now I want ground. Fortunately, I had a whole house surge system in place, and we'll go through that. It stopped it from spreading throughout. So when I had that insurance company call, you know, I told her, well, you know, I'll cook the TV and that and this and that. And she says, well, what about the refrigerator? What about the microwave? She starts rattling them off. And I said, oh, no, they're fine. How can that be? It's supposed to, you know, it usually takes everything out. I said, well, I had a whole house surge unit. So I saved myself a lot of money. The AC system, everything else was fine. So I got lucky. But it also showed me where I had a hole. I forgot one thing on the TV. I had all my rotors for my ham stuff covered, but I didn't have that covered. So Mother Nature will find your weak spot. My next door neighbor, uh, he got a hit and it went to his wellhead. We were on well and septic. It went from his wellhead through the wiring for the power into his house. Fortunately, I had installed because I'd already been hit. He had whole house surge protection. It didn't pass beyond that, but his well pump was cooked. But through induction, because it was a nearby strike, it got into his TV system where he had direct TV and it got into that, cooked his direct TV box and all of that. But it didn't jump and it went into the electrical system. It didn't go any farther than that circuit. So once again, having the protection into different spots makes it important. So, you know, he had some expensive repairs. And there's nothing worse than not having water, you know, when it cooks your well pump. And those trips are like 1500 bucks when you have that guy show up. Then there's utility-induced surges. How many of you knew that there was utility-induced surges? Dr. Tim? Yeah, okay, a couple of you here. This is caused by power feed switching. 
that's going on out there. So they're feeding from this generator to this generator. In the case of TVA, it may be coming from, okay, we're gonna be up at Center Hill Lake, it's coming off of there, and now we're going to the coal plant up in Galton area, you know, that kind of thing, it's switching around. And when they're changing those feeds, you're getting small pulses. And, you know, it's invisible to you most of the time, but for those of us who've been in the business for a while and you have a recorder, you'll see that going on during the day. I think a clue for you may be, look around when you see the lights go like this. You'll see a little dimming, it just happens. Your air conditioner didn't kick in, nothing happened, just the light switch, that switching going on. But what's happening is that's a surge. It's a small surge, but it's one that's coming into your home hitting all your electronics, whether hardwired or so, anybody that's plugged in is getting jolted. So when you think about all the power supplies you have throughout your house, this is what's causing early life expectancy issues with some of your equipment. So if you have a, you know, a refrigerator that's like six years old and it croaks, you go, gee, that's a little early, they should last 10 to 15 years. Or other equipment that seems to prematurely fail, high probability it's this type of surge that's eating away at your power supplies. So similar to a storm induced power outage, when they do a restart, like the power drops and you don't know why and it comes back in, that inrush is just like a lightning surge. It's slamming into the electronics in your house and it's coming in with some serious voltage. It's a quick spike. I mean, they get it under control real fast, but you had zero and then you came now I'm back up. So that's a slam into your system while it levels and it happens so quick. So think about it. Over time, this is fatiguing your electronics in your house. And then there's my favorite. You did it. Homeowner induced surges. Think about this. 80%, this is documented, 80% of the surges in your house are caused by you. So you're aging your own equipment and you don't even know it. So think about things in your house that can draw a rapid amount of current. And this causes your power spikes within your home. So when you're gonna go run the vacuum around, oh man, I got that 20 amp super vacuum, you know, that sucker just cleans the floor. When you turn that on, that circuit takes a dive and then the power comes back. Well, that's a spike to anything on that circuit and sometimes it can spread through your load center. So once again, you've got that, you've got table saws. You know, I'm gonna go out in the handyman shop and I'm out there in the garage going at it and the lights dim. That's a surge. Every time you do something or you have a window air conditioner, you know, I need to have that extra room clean and then to turn that thing on and you see the lights dim, that's a surge. Every time you see that, think surge, that's bad. How about the inrush current on a freezer? That too. That's why you put it on the garage circuit and have it on a dedicated circuit to limit to that. Yes, that's what I do. So once again, those lights dimming are your indicator something's wrong. And then once again, these are just small surges, but over time they take a toll. So you gotta do something about it. So how do induced surges work? Well, you know, when we think about the lightning I talked to you before about, you know, your house wiring, everything that you have as wire is an antenna in your home. So that nanosecond surge from mother nature to start is what's deadly to your equipment. That's what fries things real quick. And it doesn't have to be in direct contact. As I said, you can have induction. It's no different than your receiver. That antenna wire is taking an induced current from a radio signal and bringing it into your receiver. Your house wiring's doing the same thing, except at a higher level. So, also, real important, the energy travels both directions on your circuit and your wire in your house. So think about this, and I'm gonna give some examples here. It flows one way, it can flow another way because the wire's there. So when the current hits, it's looking for ground. It's just looking for ground. So it's gonna go both directions. So the ham shack in the house are really one big, happy, electronically wired family. So. No, no, no contrary information to QST, but you can't, you can't just look at it as a bubble, is, is the way I look at it. You want to protect your shack, and I'll show you some ideas for that, but you also need to protect the house because they work in tandem. And so while the QST article is fantastic on the ground and what they suggest, I don't think too many of us can wire our house that way. You know, we're in a spare bedroom or you're up in the bonus room or whatever. You're, 
your wife isn't going to let you put a copper strip around the inside of the house. Sorry, mine wouldn't. So, you know, what are you going to do? What can you do? But you have about 15K of exposure in the average house. Put that down in your brain. Think about all the electronics in your home. You have about 15K on average in the study we did. So what do you have? Well, you got HVAC, that's big, that's big money right there. You have your television, computers, I mean, there they all are. What's it cost to replace them? Let me throw one else at, one other idea at you. You have, what's your deductible on your insurance policy? You have instant exposure, most of us probably start at about 1500 bucks, maybe higher. So that's your cash out when you get hit. So if you got 15K worth of exposure, the first 1500's on you. Wouldn't it be a little less expensive to invest in some surge protection to minimize that? So that's, you know, just a reasonable people think about that and you go, wow, that's a lot of exposure. So let's go about a view of a typical home and now my graphic's not working because it's layered. I have a graphic of the house, it'll be on the presentation later, that shows you all the different rooms to think about and what potentially is there to uh, protect. But the discovery of crossover surge damage really came out in the late 80s and early 90s um, with the explosion of cable TV and internet. Before that, you just had a TV antenna and that's all we all had. And then here comes the connected world. Well, a lot of insurance claims started showing up and the insurance companies start evaluating why are we getting all these claims for electrical damage. So working at Square D at the time, you know, you've got what's called multi-port devices. So when you think about the back of a cable box or a back of anything on your TV you have these days, you have an ethernet connection, you have your coax, and you have your AC. So you have all three, and we call it multi-port connections. And they were discovering all the damage was coming that way through the power supplies where one system had a higher level of impedance than the other, and it would jump across and burn out the power supply. So all those impedances, differentials, are what, what happened, it was what's causing the burnups of the equipment, and they needed to find a way to fix that. So for Square D, and here we go again, the, the pictures aren't showing, um, State Farm approached us. And I was in one of the meetings with State Farm and they said, hey, we've got this problem of surge protection uh, need, being needed here because it's going across, can you help us solve this? And at the time, we had a whole lot of industrial protection because we did a lot of the early data centers and you know, factories needed surge protection for equipment, but they didn't have a lot in the residential line. So we were challenged to try to go do that. So one goal was to develop equipment that could deal with it simultaneously. And the other way was, can we find a way to get the whole house electrical system, cable system, and ethernet system on the same ground instead of having different potentials? Could we do that? And the answer was yes, and that graphic's not showing, so I'm not exactly sure how to deal with this. So I'm gonna have to, that's why the show and tell today. So one of the early units that Square D came out with looked like this. This would mount to the bottom of your load center and in the inside, you have an AC surge protector. You have an ethernet cable surge protection for the cable company. And you have these modules below for the uh, cable TV or your satellite TV or your master antenna system. What this does is you have this going back to your um, load center. So this goes to your circuit breaker. This green goes to your ground in your load center, and this goes to your neutral. And now when you have everything routed through one box, the whole home impedance is the same. So this stopped the crossover. So this is an example of one and how we did it. So this was the challenge, this was a result of the challenge. This was an early generational unit that we've designed. Whoops. I'm gonna be losing a lot of graphics here, which I really need here, so I'm not sure how to deal with this, so we'll. They'll be visible in YouTube, but you guys aren't seeing them either. And I really like my graphics. Um, maybe we have to take it offline. I don't know. So I'm going to try to approach both areas. And I'm losing all my graphics. This is going to be a killer. Um, number one will be the ham shack. So surges come into the home via the ham radio system, right? Your equipment connection. So you've got the cables, rotor cable, and ground if you have rotors. And at your home, all the different systems I've already spoken about. And then, of course, the indirect strike 
gives you the, the surges into your different systems in the house. So I'm going to tear, about, tear apart both versions of this. And now I don't get any graphics again. So we might pause this for a minute and try to see what's the problem here. Because I have some really good graphics. I could go to the PDF, I guess. Okay. Oh, here we go. I don't know if I can get this in the show mode, but now you guys can see the, uh, the house graphic. And this will this will give you clues as to everything from outdoor equipment. These are the kind of things you need to protect. Uh, this is a visual that I think will be more beneficial to you. And I'll just scroll this way instead to make sure we have all the graphics going forward. But you know, when you look at your house, think about all of these different things. Especially if you have an EV car charger. Oh my God! Right? Do you want that thing blowing up in your garage? You know how expensive that is to wire one of those in. So, you know, be careful. And you got pool pumps and stuff like that. So I talked about the crossover. Here's the visual I was trying to show. So for those of you at home, you can see here now the graphic. This is what I was showing here in the room. AC module, network surge module, and then here's the coax surge modules below. So as I mentioned, we're going to talk about both evenly. First of all, typical ham shack structure is pretty straightforward. For those of us that are new into the hobby, you usually have one radio and then maybe an HT. You have an outside antenna. Uh, it's wires tied to a tree like a dipole. You've got your insulators. And then you have your feed line coming into your house. So there's your typical setup. What are you doing to protect yourself there from the outside, right? So you have all kinds of surge entry points just from Mother Nature into the ham shack. In advanced radio shacks, it's a little different. And when I use the term advanced, I'm, I'm using this loosely. That means you have more than one radio. You have multiple ports coming in. You have lots of different things going on. So don't, don't be insulted if I've got the simple version versus advanced. Those of us who've been in the hobby a long time have more than one radio. So we're uh, tempting fate with a lot more lines out there. So no one shack is identical to another. Everybody's unique in how you try to get your ground set up, how you do your electrical equipment in there, et cetera. But there's some basic should do's. Number one, disconnect the coax when you're not playing with your radio. That would be recommendation number one for two reasons. One is we may not have thunderstorms for five days, but anybody paying attention to the sun of late and the uh, EMP coming from that now and then, Always be ready because you have a lot of sensitive solid state things going on inside that radio that can fry in a dime. So if you don't have protection on your coax for surge, be ready. Also, power strip surge protection. You know, how many of you are using power strips for all the little electronic mumbo jumbos you have in your shack? Is your power strip a surge strip or is it a standard strip? This is a surge strip I'm holding here. This one's rated at 400 volts. We're going to go into that in a little bit. So this has some protection, but if you're using a standard power strip that you got cheap at Home Depot, it's not going to do anything for you. Paul, what about using a, a UPS? Does that offer you any protection? If you're plugged into the UPS protection side of it, I have some APC ones, and I can tell you there are protected ports and unprotected ports. Make sure you're in the protected ports. So the answer is yes, there's protection in the, on the UPSs where it switches to the battery backup, there should be protection in there. Also, you know, you don't want to be unplugging your power cord all the time. So while it's, you know, that's the optimal way of doing it, you don't want to wear that cord out. So it's probably easier to put in a real surge strip. Oh, that's right, I got to roll now. So I've got a graphic here that I got out of QST from 2002. So I found this to be very helpful to help you get a perspective. So when you look at this later as reference, study the diagram, it's an eye chart. But if you take a look at you know, how to lightning protect a shack, you wanna touch, and they cover that in this QST article too, you've gotta cover all the different access points. These are all the holes that I was talking about before. Like I got zapped on a rotor cable I forgot to put protection on. This is how you do it. You gotta analyze what's plugged in where. Everything, even if you have a TV plugged in in your ham shack to have the football game on the fall while you're doing FT8, that cable is an entry point into your shack. You have that protected because it'll jump from there to the AC inside the TV and then into the AC of the shack and now it's distributing 
throughout your, your toast. So I leave this as a diagram for you guys as reference because some circuits are 240 volt for your amplifiers. How are you protecting that? No surge strip's gonna cover that. Now you're talking about something a little more beefy. You need something that's gonna take care of the 240 side. What do you have for that? So important takeaway, analyze the chart, graph your own station and say, where's the hole? Challenge yourself, I challenge you. Try to find the hole because once you've been zapped and you're laying out the cache, it's sort of too late. So hopefully this will help you a little bit. Other things too, use additional grounding and surge protection. All right, different from Franklin, um, and I'll show you what I used to have in Franklin. Um, I, where I live now, I've had the chance to redo it again. So I've gone up a level uh, having been hit before. But on the right hand side, you'll see uh, that's a DX engineering weatherproof box. And each of those are these little transit trap connectors in there. I have them mounted to a plate that is grounded through that copper strap to a rod right at that coax entry point. So the idea is to have surge protection on the coax before it enters the building. And these have nice little replaceable modules in the inside. I can unscrew these. They have low power and high power versions. I really like these. So I've fallen in love with them. I buy them. And you can get either use the ground strap on the bottom or you can uh, get what they call a little adapter, which then mounts to the, to the plate and grounds it out that way. But these things are lifesavers because they're taking care of each individual coax line. It looks insane, but it does work. I have a lot of antennas now, and I do it that way. My tower is grounded at the base, just like in the QST article, and I'd love to pound in more rods in the future to do a dispersion field for my tower. But right now, the three is the basic. Plus, search can protection, if you've got a vertical, can be applied at the base. So on a vertical antenna, you pound in the, the pipe, you bond to that, and you say, well, I'm sort of grounded. Well, I go one step further, I pound a ground rod in next to the vertical, and then that little square box above the DX engineering box is a, a lightning protection right there. That's a surge protector. So it's mounted to my DX engineering plate with all my you know, cables going out into the ground there for my, uh, my reflecting. And I find that gives me another insurance policy. So I have this at the house and then that one out in the field at the vertical. You don't have to have stuff that this complex. You want to do it really cheap and you only have two antennas, you can go to Home Depot, buy an AC disconnect plastic box, and they're cheap. They're like 15 bucks. You can open that baby up, take the guts out, put that inside, and then ground out. So you can just get something outside before it enters the building is my encouragement to you. I just showed you this transit trap version. That's the, the visual of it. You can see all the characteristics and the frequency and its ratings and how fast it works and it, and they fire fast, they work. I have had them burn out and you go, wow, that was an interesting storm that went by and how come the vertical is not working? <laughs> and you find out you've cooked, you know, it did its job. And that's really what you want. But I like them, they're replaceable cartridges. I have spares floating around just for that reason. And it's weatherproof design and they're, they're fantastic. Another one is, you'll see these all the time. Like here's Alpha Delta, they've got a switch they said Wow, okay, we can help lightning protect your shack at the switch. Okay, the downside is you let it in the building. The plus side is, well, they have surge protection in there. But really important is they have some text here at the bottom that without a good ground, it will not operate properly. Okay, what is your ground? Are you grounding the switch or just having the switch sit there and you're, you're playing in between? You need to be running a strap from that switch to your ground system in your shack. It's a backup, but I wouldn't say that's optimal, but they promote it that way. So once again, be careful. It's all how it's all tied together. Also, you need a good ground rod. You gotta have a good ground rod. Now, I have a little device here that I have in my collection. I'm, I'm, I'm a junkie, so you, not everybody owns one of these, but this is a ground rod tester. This will test your impedance levels and your resistance levels at ground. And you can clamp it around your rod. You see it, I've got it around my rod there. And it's at 12.26 ohms. That's a beautiful thing. 
low resistance. It can go right, any surge coming down that tower is going there. I also put on the tower, I didn't show it in the graphic, that's why I mentioned coming today. I use these too. So this clamps to your tower leg or you can use it to a pipe and it'll take the shield and ground that out and give it one more chance to get you know, off the, the wire before it gets in the house, your surge. Any kind of extra currents. And you know, you gotta think about it. When you get wire out there, even in the winter time, we get cold winter nights, that wire hanging in the air on a windy January day is getting in currents induced into it from the wind. So it's not just, oh gee, lightning. It can happen anytime. Wind will cause energy to flow on your wire. You want to bleed that stuff off. But anyway, these are you know handy if you know you really want to get serious sometime and for a beer and gas money, I can come test your rod, no problem. Now, the National Electric Code, and this is where things get interesting, and John will have an opinion here because I heard him comment on it on Tuesday. They recommend bonding all separate ground rods the house to your electrical ground. The article in QST this month says the same thing. In a perfect world, that's a lovely thing to do. But guess what? We have concrete driveways. We have things in the way. I have my shack in a separate building that grounds way back in the primary building. How in the hell am I supposed to do all of that? So I'm not following the code to the letter, but I know what variance I'm causing in my impedances in the building, so I'm being as careful as I can be. It's just not all, always physically possible. And you know what? There are some hams who believe that the RF ground should be separate from the electrical ground, so I'm not introducing currents back in. So there's two schools of thought. I don't endorse either one. You do what's right for yourself. I have tried to surround my house, previous houses, with ground rods. And there's always a driveway in the way or something. And I'm not paying a boring service to come through. So you live with it and you take your risk. But at least be aware that's what the National Electric Coal would like you to do. Okay, sliding on down. A patch bay. Think about this. Okay, this is, this is my nutty station. But I have the picture from Franklin to show you. With lots of antennas, if you start to get into the farm business like I am, I love my antennas. I love, the more wire up, the happier I am. Um, you might want to do something called a quick disconnect or a slip-on connector. So I brought one here, show and tell, with a copper plate. And you can see here on the top, this is in my closet, I have a wooden plate and a lot of barrel connectors that look like this. You see these at the ham fest, they're really long. They're passed through for chassis a lot of times, but you'll see them longer than this. And basically what I did was I took a piece of wood and drilled a bunch of holes through, mounted them in there. So these now are insulated, when you think about it, because it's in wood. And the top part are all the connections to my radios and the switches in my, my shack. The bottom part is a copper plate that I bought at Dayton years ago. This is a small version of it. And I ground that to the station ground, okay? And then I put the pass-through connector through. And to make life easy, I like quick disconnects. Here's the slide-on connector. And they go, you just push it on like that. And now I import it in. Sort of like what we did, in, I, we used to work at a radio station. You have patch bays to wire up microphones. It's the same concept. Except now that when I'm done, I can disconnect. So it's real easy. I leave the top ones hanging and I disconnect the bottom. So the idea here is try to think of that or maybe an MMFJ antenna strip. You've seen those. They have you know six ports, one or whatever. You can use these slide-on connectors, and they're fantastic. OK, any questions on this part? It's a little nutty looking. But if you look on the, on the left, that's what I used to have in my crawl space in my attic. So in Franklin, I had a whole bunch of antennas I, when I lived in my HOA. I did the same thing, same concept there. It was just behind a little access door. Some other ideas, separate your shack ground from the outside ground. And you go, whoa, why do you want to do that? Well, we talked earlier about the lightning putting induced charges into the soil around your property if you get a direct hit. I have a tower up, so now I'm saying hit me. So I want to make sure that I avoid trying to let currents back in. So all I am doing here is I have a knife switch, basically, light duty safety switch. And when I'm not playing with the radio, so it's in the off position. The idea there is now I have isolated my shack ground 
from that copper plate I showed you before, because that's still connected. But the shack ground passes past that and then around to the radios. So now what I've done is I've isolated it from inrush coming that way, should it come through the earth ground and try to get into the shack. Little, sounds a little weird, but think about it. If you have a simple knife switch, you're doing the same thing. So if you have just one radio and you have a small wire going out to the ground, put a make break on it and you've now isolated it. And you see knife switches at the flea markets all the time. How about the old surge strip? plug-in type. So here's a couple of different styles out there. And as I showed you, you know, you've got the surge strips play a role, and we'll go through the, an example of that. But your idea here is handling the low level. Surge strips by UL, once again, are rated maximum of 6,000 volts, but most of them don't go anywhere near that. Um, but the idea is you want to protect what's plugged into it, and that's what these offer. Plus, they also have the polyphaser units. They're similar to the electrical AC system ones that I, I, I showed before. But the idea is you're, you've got to ground it to something. And this is using the return path in the ground in the electrical system. So when you think about moving from the shack to your home, you know, what do you want to think about? What do you want to do? There's so many opportunities for surge damage outside the ham shack. And what's critical here is what are you going to do about it? All things to think about. You can put surge protection at the electrical panel, at the distribution panel of your house. Okay? Or add in surge protection at point of use, which is what we call the type of surge strips, or a UPS has those. And where possible, use telephone and coaxial protection modules. Cover all three at least. If you can't put them, and this is what's hard. When you have an existing home, all the wiring, you don't know what they did when they built the place. It's hard to centralize surge protection with one of these. You can do it, but the nice thing about this is it's convenient, keeps it all on the same impedance level, but if you can't, go to plan B and use individual modules to try to protect your different systems. So what are some of the options there? And once again, I didn't want to lose the graphics, so I got to scroll up here. But the idea here is with multipath approach, you're looking at your whole house. Think about the whole house, even your outside buildings. You know, if you've got power going out to a shed that's still a path in, what are you doing to protect that? So you can put secondary arresters in places, et cetera. So we'll go through some of the options here. I'm going to walk through your electrical system of your home. One of the things, and I love these little graphics we made years ago, uh, surge protection components got to work at both ends of the circuit. So think about each circuit breaker in your house. You got circuit breaker is one end, the other end is the outlet, okay? So as you look at your load center and your outlet, if you don't have any protection, a surge comes in from mother nature, it's going to go both ways. So it'll fry what's there and it'll go to the distribution center and then it'll say, oh, I get to spread house wide, that's great. Now it's cooking things. If you only protect at the load center, which is like one of these that plug into your breaker panel or you can mount below outside the panel, then you're protecting the distribution box, but you forgot the other end of the line. And as I showed in those lightning examples I gave you before that I've lived through, it will find the hole. And if only one circuit gets that surge, it can go to the box and be stopped, but whatever's plugged in there gets the rest of it. So you want to make sure you're covering both ends of things. Some other examples here is if you forget to do the load center and you only do the outlet, okay, I saved the ham radio but forgot the TV. Whoops. Think both ways. Protect both ends to make sure you can shunt it off to ground. So wherever you've got sensitive electronic equipment, whether it's your TV cabinet, whether it's on the wall TV, whether it's your stereo system, your home office, protect those outlets, but also get something in your AC box. And this is where it might get a little more interesting. <clears throat> so what are your options at your electrical box? Quite a few things. So I shot my outside ones here because the way they've set up my home is that I have the meter base comes in where the utility feeds. I have a box on one side that feeds my main house that goes to a load center 
which is a main lugs inside, which I've now changed to a main breaker. I had that changed out. I went from Brand X to I had to go back to my company, so I paid somebody to do it. And then I have the other one goes to my outbuilding. So I have outside surge protection. This is 50 kV, and this wires into a two-pole breaker in that sub-panel outside. So a lot of homes have an outside panel that has probably some extra spaces in it. That's the first place to start. This allows you to stop it at the point of entry, taking care of the utility surges and anything Mother Nature hits on the wires down the street. So when that pole gets hit, the wire is going to take the current to your house. This stops it from entering. So I call this, you know, heading it off at the pass. Put something at the main entry to your house. And one thing, and I brought a breaker here, yes. You know what, I'll show another graphic and I'll come back to that. So you can see how it's mounted below. And, you know, if you have an outside panel like I do, that was easy. There was a double pole space, slam dunk, I added it in. This is a no-brainer. You buy these at Lowe's. You know, you can get them and have somebody install. So once again, if you don't feel comfortable with electricity, I'm not encouraging you to do this. I don't need to read about you in the paper. Um, as I used to tell folks in training at Home Depot, I said, you know, when you screw up on plumbing, it leaks. When you screw up on electrical, you're dead. So you don't want that. But it connects to a two-pole breaker, and they're pretty easy to install. Or if you don't have an outside panel, or you have an inside lugs panel, you can add it inside. So this type of unit is the size of a double pole circuit breaker. So I just need to take this lead and I take this to the neutral bar and we're there. So this is really nice. They just plug in like a breaker, click. Most of the different manufacturers have something like this. And this thing is really great. It has a little light on it that tells you I'm working. And if the light goes out, you're done. But once again, you know, it's a simple two pole circuit breaker mount. And I, I have this, that's, that's my new load center I installed in my house. I took out Brand X because I wanted, I needed more space for the things I need to do. So I was able to put in a square D there. Or if your panel is not behind sheetrock, or if it is behind sheetrock, you can add something like this. They have cover plates. You'd have to have the the rock cut away, and then this mounts into the nipple there, wires up inside, just like it does on the outside, and they have a special cover plate you can put over it to hide the, the cuts into the rock. So something else to think about there, uh, and you can see how visually that can be done. But most of us have, and it's pretty much code required, they put a load center in and then this sheet rock covered. Uh, if you have one where you have a home where you have a basement, it might be mounted down there and you, you have it open, then you can just mount it in. Also, the whole house systems I showed before, you know, you can put the bigger one in there and if you can get all your network cables and everything to be that master point first, now you have your impedance at the same level, house wide, and then distribute. And then you've got that balancing on the systems. You don't have to worry about it jumping across the different systems, but once again, it, you're just open to disaster without protection on the cable TV and everything else. So I, I put a little chart in here from the company um, that shows the different levels and grades. This is more for reference, so we have something to look at. There's low-end units that have 25K uh, protection to uh, this one's a 50, they have up 75, you know, more is better. And I'll show you why in a minute. But these are here for you as reference. And you just got to evaluate your outlet protection. So let's throw a couple terms at you just so when you go to the store, you know what you're buying. Because cheaper is not better in surge protection. Especially, no offense to our friends from overseas, but some of that Chinese stuff is literally garbage. You want something like Trip Light or other brands that are a little well known. But some key metrics here. One, the term joules. That's energy absorption and dissipation ratings, okay? And the higher the joule rating, the better. So I have a table on the next page that's there for reference that when you look at buying one of these, it's voltage and joule ratings. Higher joule, lower the voltage, okay? So your clamping voltage is where the uh, oxidizing MOVs kick in. 
and you want lower, you want 400 volts or below, 300 is better. So you'll look at this one here on the back, it says, oh, 400 volts. Okay, I wouldn't mind plugging average lights and crud into it, but I would not plug my ham radio into this, okay? I would want something that had a 300 volt clamping voltage. The clamping voltage on some of the early versions of this was like 600 volts. Well, it's better than nothing because it's meant to do the load center. It wasn't meant to protect the TVs. Now they have lowered the clamping voltage in these in the last five years that they're, they're dynamite. They'll protect the whole house. So once again, it's, you want to stop things from being distributed. And if you, what's the best way of describing this? There's not a lot of air gap in here. So, you know, you want the most you can get, but once the lightning crosses here, it's gonna jump and get into the, the box. So, you know, realize that's why UL only rates them for a certain rating, because they can only handle so much. So it's important to have the big device at the load center and this at the outlet, they work in tandem. They work as a system. And you want one that has an LED to make sure you know that it's working. So here's a little table I put in here for just, I copy it off the internet. And it basically tells you if you're trying to protect these things, here's the recommended joule ratings and the recommended clamping voltage. So you see everybody's in the 300 volt range trying to be down there. You want that for the maximum protection you can afford. So pay a little more or you'll just pay later. It will work like that. There's also a life expectancy to these things. You know, keep an eye on the LED because after a long period, five, six years, you might see the LED out. It may have given its life already for all those multiple little ones coming from the utility. So keep, you got to keep an eye on those things. Another gotcha. This one's always fun. How many of you have a home that's over 20 years old? Guess what? UL only rates your ground rod for 20 years. Surprise! Okay, reason why is you have acid in the soil that breaks down the rod over time, and the utility usually puts one in at the meter, and you don't get to see it. They're usually in the meter base. If your contractor was really cheap and gave you a galvanized rod to get past code, they're only rated for five years. Oops. So is your ground really working? Is all the surge protection you're putting in have a place to discharge to, or is it a big resistor? Um, something that if you do decide to get some electrical work done, have your electrician take a look at the rod, it doesn't take long to pound in a new one, and replace it. So just keep that in mind. If your house is like 40 years old, I'll bet you your resistance level is a little bit higher than it should be. So that makes it harder for your surge protection systems to work. So many new homes have the, you know, ground rod is hidden beneath the meter base, as I mentioned. Have your electrician look at it. Older homes, some of them, you may be able to see the ground rod. They may have put just a meter socket and a pipe down, and then you'll see the actual ground rod there. Don't disconnect it, but you can check it. You can see if it looks all corroded have somebody look at that professionally. They could be deteriorated enough that if you disconnect that, that's the house ground, you'll get a jolt. So don't let yourself up. But just that something, let a professional electrician look at it, he'd kill the power to your meter, and then safely replace that. So in conclusion, told you it'd be an hour, um, you can be struck by a variety of surges. If you came away with anything today, I hope I opened your eyes up to the world of, wow, how can I get zapped? Surge protection methods are a system. Don't let it spread throughout your house. Try to control it. You've got many different avenues, both in your shack and in your house, to protect all the electronics in your home. Make sure your utility ground is really working. You know, it may be working some, but you'd like it working better than some. You'd like that resistance to be low. And use a qualified electrical installer for all work if you're not trained and comfortable working with this stuff. Don't hurt yourself. I know we're ham operators and that thing that says, you know, don't open the lid and we want to pop the lid anyways and take a look, that not in your electrical system of your home. Don't do that. Use a qualified electrical installer. 
like I said, when my ground rod needed to be replaced, I hired an electrician because I know better than to go touch that thing. And working inside your panel, if you're not comfortable working in there, that's important. One other little tidbit I forgot to mention. Um, for those of you with Square D branded breakers, if your panel is full and you're trying to get a surge protection unit in, if you have a 10, 20, or 30 amp, anywhere in there, 10 to, 20, 10 to 30 amp range double pole breaker, UL rates Square D breakers and allows to have two connections. And in here, I'd encourage you to come up and look at this. You'll see there's two little bends in the plate that holds the, that clamps the wire down. In Square D branded breakers, that would allow you to put your double pole, one of these, like outside, into this. Okay, you can tap this um, because you're firing in nanoseconds. It's not drawing any current. So if you have a dryer or you know something that's on a 220, this would allow you to do a tap on the 220 side and have two connection points. So that's just a little tidbit of knowledge from the Squirt E side. Also, reading material is always good to have good stuff like, you know, here's a polyphaser book. I picked this up at Dayton years ago. It's a little heavy reading, but it's good stuff on grounding techniques and how MOVs work and what do you need to do by your radial system in your house and you know how the dispersion fields work and stuff like that. So I'd recommend extra reading. There's good stuff on the internet too. Additional resources. Um, if you can get back to older QSTs, this was a great series. It was a three month issue, part one, two, and three in June through August of 2002. They did a great job. Uh, I have that as reference in here. And also um, Erase Solutions, you know, they do surge arresters. They have some of the equipment there. I also have up front here, you know, you can see these. Here's a, this doesn't have a replaceable module, but this is a jet stream surge protector. You see these at Hamfest. And then if you want to see, this is a future one I'll put back into use. This is what the MOVs look like inside of a rotor cable uh, box. So to protect your box outside. And then this bonds to the tower. Uh, through a U-bolt. So these are all the MOVs inside. I cut off the wires when I moved, so it's easy, but I'll be reusing this, but I wanted you to see in the inside, what does one look like? It's basically some heavy-duty MOVs inside there that protect each line uh, of the uh, eight-wire cable. And then a couple different small boxes. And then Schneider Electric, we have surge protection. I put that there just to plug the company uh, for letting me use some of their graphics. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Um, hope you learned something from all this today. I hope I scared you a little bit, really. That was Doug's hope. He was hoping I was going to scare everybody today. What can I answer for you? Okay, for those online, Jeff was asking a question about he's on the second floor. He doesn't have a ground going out. I have a suggestion on how to change that. Uh, and he's using the utility ground, but there's also power supplies that don't have the third plug to ground to the electrical system, what do you do with those? Um, I would still suggest putting in an outside ground. And one way to do that, and I did this in Franklin, and my, I was above the garage, uh, my shack was on the second floor, and I had a ra ground rod outside. There's actually a, uh, a way of using old coax, and you put some uh, 1KV resistors on it, or, or a capacitor at the top, and it allows you to ground out to ground through your coax. It's not optimal, but it's better than no ground. And if you want, I can get that article and send it, send it to the It gives you RF ground as well. Gives you an RF ground as well. And it's just basically, I used in Franklin an old coax run that I didn't want to use for anything anymore. And I ran that outside to the ground rod. And it gave me an outside ground and it wasn't, it, it doesn't radiate, like if you used a continuous wire, like a 14 gauge or something down the side of the house, on 10 meters or 15 meters, that thing's gonna radiate. But if you use it this way, and with the, using the shield and the center conductor the way they designed it, um, it will allow you not to radiate. But it'll still give you your RF ground and the ground you need for the equipment. Another trick that I use in my shack is, if you're looking for multiple ports of ground, um, at Home Depot, in the electrical department, they sell ground uh, buses uh, that, are, that go inside your load center. And they're about this long. And you'll see them, they call them PK3s, 
nines and 18s and 23. They're meant to go inside the load center to provide that grounding inside. They buy, you sell them as an accessory. I take those and I screw them underneath my, my bench and that's where my ground ties through and I can take each of my equipment grounds directly to its own port so I'm in a star system as opposed to having a ground loop. Little trick I learned over the years.